So, last but not least is our keynote speaker, John, John Colley of the University of Southampton, who's a research fellow there. Um, he has 20 years experience in development of EDA tools for simulation, test generation, code coverage, and model checking. He is now involved in the ongoing development of verification and validation methods for high consequence systems with formal and simulation based in defense, rail, and semiconductor sectors. And the title of John's talk, as I said, it brings everything together, safety and security considerations for software and digital hardware verification. Thank you. Yeah, safety, security, hardware, software, just to please Mike. <laughs> First of all, an acknowledgement this work's been done under the sector project, which Mike talked about, which seems quite a long time ago. But I think uh, he told you enough about that. Okay, so let's look at a vision of the future. We can just pick any from the from the internet. Zero accidents, mobility for all. We've talked about automotive, we've talked about aerospace, avionics, uh, automation, autonomy. That's the vision. I won't talk any more about the vision. This is a verification futures conference. What are the implications for verification in the future for hardware and software relating to both safety and security? Okay, so I'll start off with the, with the motivation and we'll, we've heard a lot about that during today's talks. I'll talk a little bit about standards and guidelines which have appeared in the la quite recently, particularly with respect to security, because a, a lot of new um, standards and guidelines have come out in that area. Um, standards and guidelines give us a framework in which to de develop, to meet objectives. What I also want to talk about is a method that you can use with, within these objectives to actually achieve the objectives uh, in, a, in, a, in a structured way from a system point of view, and I'll talk about why it needs to be from a system point of view, system theoretic process analysis. And then I'll go through a nice um, aerospace case study, which has come out of NASA, and you can find this case study on, on, on the web from, from NASA formal methods. I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, what are the implications, safety versus security considerations. I'll talk about organization as well, how you're going to be able to verify safety and security, and then summarize. Okay, so the first bullet is probably the most important. Safety and security are emergent properties of the system. And so they need to be verified at the system level. And this is fundamentally sums up the issue with how we're going to deal with um, safety and security verification. Because ultimately, it's what happens to the aircraft or, the, or the, the car. What are the implications for safety and security of the passengers? Uh, we're starting at the software hardware level, we need to think about the implications all the way back up to the system. Traditional verification techniques do not scale well at the system level. So you can simulate, I mean, if you see some of the figures for uh, how, how much simulation do you need to do on an autonomous vehicle, well, it might be 14,000 years. I mean, there are research being done on this, how much testing actually would be needed. Even uh, formal methods struggle to scale at this level. So what, you've, what we're seeing, and I think if you at the Design Automation Conference this year, you'll see a lot about abstraction and formal analysis. So I think there's an understanding, certainly in the hardware industry, we need to look at abstraction to be able to manage verification at the system level. And it's already happening, so clock domain crossing verification, um, CRT or formal equivalence checking. Abstraction is being used, and I want to talk about that quite a bit. <laughs> So where do we begin? We, we need to deal with uh, formal analysis and abstraction. We need to deal with safety and security, and we need to do system level verification. So these are the standards and guidelines, and I'll just go through this quite quickly. Um, this morning, Adam talked about ARP 4761, ARP 4754A for avionics. Then there's DO326A, airworthiness, security process specification which links the security process, the safety assessment process, and the system engineering process. I think this is a theme you see with these standards and guidelines. System engineering needs to be linked with safety, security, and then into the development process. There's some work being happening in the automotive industry for security. Uh, a very interesting one which became uh, final, uh, finalized guidelines is NIST 800160. So this is system security engineering considerations for the engineering of trustworthy secure systems. And I'll talk more about this term trustworthy later. So this is published guidelines. It certainly applies in the US for any cyber physical system. So 
and ISD 8160 defines what they mean by security. Freedom from those conditions that can cause loss of assets that could be financial or lives with unacceptable consequences. The system protection capability is a system control objective. That's the objective and a system design problem. I've, I've highlighted control in red because as we go through this, you'll see this is the fundamental way that we need to deal with both safety and security at the system level. So NISD 860 has this notion of trustworthiness. Uh, it's based on security, but it knows we have to deal with safety as well. So they, they define, that's their definition, trustworthy requirements can include attributes of safety, security, reliability, dependability, performance, etc. The realization is we, we have to verify this at the, at the system level, but we have to consider reliability, safety, security at the same time in this assessment to meet the requirements. It's a requirement of 800160 to produce an assurance case which means it's going to be necessary to measure the trustworthiness in terms of the requirement, are the requirements sufficiently complete, well-defined, and can be accurately assessed. So I've talked about these higher-level safety security standards and guidelines, and these will feed into a development process. And as Nick Tudor talked earlier this morning, and we've seen heard in a number of presentations, we have a very, very good um, standard, uh, objective-driven standard for developing software, DO178C, and now we also have DO333, a formal method supplement to that. And this provides guidance to software developers who wish to use formal methods. Uh, it supplements uh, 178C, and it talks about the, art the artifacts are expressed in a formal notation and the verification evidence that could be derived from them. So we have this, and it's, it's successful, and it's something that you can use not only in aerospace, but you can use it in any uh, high-consequence con system. This is table uh, FMA3. This is from these, uh, this publication of formal methods case studies uh, uh, from NASA, which is done by people from Rockwell, Darren Kofer, and Stephen Miller. And I'm really going to concentrate in this talk about the, the very high-level objectives. Do the high-level requirements comply with the system requirements? So we have standards and guidelines. They give us a process within which it can work. We can get it through to verification and to certification sign-off. What I want to talk now is a method, a technique, that you can use alongside these um, standards to actually uh, arrive at, at the, the safety case or the security case. So system theoretic process analysis, STPA, is a hazard analysis technique. You identify potential causes of accidents, that's scenarios that can lead to losses, and then you eliminate or you control the hazards. So that's this word control. So we're talking about how can your system control the state of the system to either eliminate or uh, control the hazards before damage occurs. Uh, it deals with all sorts of causal factors, design errors, software flaws, component interaction accidents, human decision-making errors, but also you can look up higher into your organization, and I will talk about this, what kind of organization and management structure do you need to, um, to, to develop the cases. It's also been applied to security analysis. Okay, so STPA, um, this book is online, Engineering a Safer World, Nancy Levison. STPA has two phases. You identify, identify potential hazardous control actions, that's the control of the system, and then from those you derive in a systematic way the safety constraints. The second phase is you determine how these unsafe control actions could occur. When you apply this to security and reliability, we may want to use some more general terms. Um, so maybe we can say identify potentially vulnerable control actions, which could apply to both safety and security. And then using the term of NIST 800160, derive the trustworthy constraints. What are the constraints on safety, security, and reliability? And then determine how these untrustworthy control actions could occur. You've seen this picture before, again from Nick Tudor. 
and earlier in the day. I'm just going to concentrate on the very top part of this, the link between the system requirements and the high-level requirements. And this is um, DO333 table FMA-3. And what we're going to do is we're going to use system theoretic process analysis, STPA, and formal modeling to demonstrate compliance of the high-level requirements to the system requirements. So the case study, and I'm just going to talk about the top half of the case study, just between system level requirements and high level requirements. The case, this case study actually goes all the way down to code level and is really worth, worth looking at. So the, the case study is a flight guidance system. So it has two physical sides or channels, one on the left, one on the right. This is re redundant implementations that communicate with each other over a cross bus channel. This is kind of what it looks like. There's some switch, the compiler can switch, and you can go from the left and, and transfer control to the right using this cross-channel bus, and it starts by default on the left. <coughs> so system level requirements stated informally, at least one side should be the pilot flying side. At most, one side should be the pilot flying side. When the transfer switch is pressed, it will always change the pilot flying side. The system starts on the primary side as the prim as that's the left side as the pilot flying side, and the system shall not change the pilot flying side unless the transfer switch is pressed. This is English, and what we'd like to do is take this English and move towards a more structured representation of what those requirements are. Okay, so we can start off with a system level model, and you can use the, the formal modeling language of your choice. But it's quite straightforward, and in the case study it uses a state machine, but you, you can effectively define it at the system level. If you think about you standing behind the pilots in the cockpit, and you're observing the state of, of the system. And you've just got two variables. You've got the left flying, this is the initial state in red, and the left taking over is false. And it can stay there, and then non-deterministically, it either stays with a state left it's flying, or the right-hand side initiates take control. We move into a state where the, the left is still flying, but the right is taking over, and then uh, uh, the right completes take control, and now we have the right-hand side flying, and it can stay there. So a very, very simple view, which clearly, and very easy to validate, that this, uh, this system level model is, uh, represents the requirements. Because there's only two states, left flying, right flying, and you can't be in both, and you have to be in at least one of them. So what we want to do now is to implement this. And the way it's going to be implemented is there's going to be a flight guidance system on the, right, on the left and on the right, and these are mirror copies of each other. Uh, there's a transfer switch. And there's a light to say which side is, um, is, is flying. And then there's a bus, two-way bus. And the communication between the left and the right is through these channels here. So again, we can talk about the informal requirements of the system. And this is of the implementation. So when we implement this as a piece of software which is duplicated, these two physical sides, I won't go into this much detail, but uh, each bus in the synchronous pilot flying example transfers its input to the output with a one-step delay. So it's going to be a, it's a synchronous bus. Only the pilot not flying side listens to the transfer switch. If a side believes itself to be the not flying side, it will become the flying side when it sees the transfer switch pressed, i.e. sees a rising edge. And the same if the side is the pilot flying side, it will become the not flying side when it sees the other side become the flying side. Again, this is informal English. So what we do now is what we want to do is identify the vulnerabilities of the system based on the con control actions. So looking at the picture, the control action is this output here, is assert that you're flying. And this is assert you're flying. So you can assert or deassert that setting. So if we apply STPA, what we do is we write down the main control actions, assert pilot flying, 
de-assert pilot flying. And then what we look at in a systematic way is, is there a way of not providing this assert pilot flying which causes a vulnerability? Is there a case where providing it can cause a vulnerability? Uh, wrong timing or wrong order? Or if it's a, a signal that's going to be held for a period of time, if it's stopped too soon or applied too long? So assert pilot flying. If that's not provided when it should be provided, the request for control is not issued when the transfer switch has been pressed. So the pilot presses the switch, and for some reason, fault or some security failure, then that, then that is not uh, communicated across the bus. This is a vulnerability of the system. Uh, the next column is, what happens if you provide it when you shouldn't? So your request for control is issued when the transfer switch has not been pressed. So you go through each of these systematically and identify the vulnerability associated with each of those. It's a very simple mechanism. It's nice and systematic. So we have a vulnerability, which is a state of the system which could lead to a failure. The first type of failure is there's a loss of required function, which is serious, but if you know you've lost the function, you can mitigate against that. What is much more worrying and especially from a security point of view, is mode confusion. What happens if one or more of these vulnerabilities is exploited and the crew don't know what state the system is in which could lead to a loss of the aircraft? So there's, there's two, two, two cases of vulnerability, loss of, loss of uh, functionality and mode confusion. What you want to do is avoid this because this is most, most dangerous. So what we can do is we can take the output of this STPA table and we can now derive and trace the constraints on the controller. And again, I won't go into this detail, but the important thing now is what we're trying to do is write the English in a much more structured way rather than the informal. So we can, what we're doing here is pilot flying must not be asserted by a controller unless a rising edge has been received on the transfer switch and the controller state is not flying. So if you went to Nick Tudor's talk earlier today, what you're moving to is a structured English which you can then validate and, and show has no ambiguity. At this point, you can choose your formalism underneath. So you could then translate this to a formal language to do your verification, which is what we do. So we've, we've gone from the high-level requirements, we've identified the vulnerabilities, we've now uh, define the constraints and we trace those to the original system level requirements R1 through to R5. Here's a nice one, the controller state and the, uh, uh, the controller left state and the controller right state must never be the same. So we've moved from the system level down to the high level software requirements and what we want to do now is take this system level model, which we've validated, and what we want to do is derive formally, and this is refinement, this is formal refinement, into a model which has two duplicate state machines representing the two controllers. So this is a view of the specification of the high level requirements for the software. And what we, what we, what we do is we actually prove that this, uh, refinement of the, the system model is a correct refinement formally of, of that system model. And what we can do also, we prove formally that L state is not equal to R state in any particular form, formal language that you choose. So what you can see here is we've, we've taken this general state, system level state, left flying, right flying, and we now have a left state and a right state. There's two state, state variables. Uh, we start in the red state, which is the initial state, and then when the right state is not flying, initiates take control because the, the, the switch has been pressed, we move into this state that the right state is not flying but taking over, and then we have synchronization between these two state machines that the R completes take control and the L relinquishes control and we end up with the, with the switch over. So the nice thing about this is we have structured natural language which we can then 
uh, use a formal engine to verify the, the high-level, top-level safety constraint. So that's the first step of STPA. Now what we do in the second step is we want to determine how these untrustworthy control actions could occur. So in step one, we consider the vulnerabilities, and now we analyze the threats so, uh, that can exploit, expose or exploit these vulnerabilities. And now we're saying, what is the difference between safety and security? As far as this process is concerned and how it applies to DO333, uh, 178C, there aren't a lot of diff not, not a lot of differences. So we have unintentional threats and we have intentional threats. There are some differences which I'll talk about. So we look at this control loop and we identify all the ways that the control errors in the, in the way these, these control signals are set could lead to a hazard which could then lead to a loss. Let's just take two of them. So if the left side there's a spurious response to relinquish control. Left is the pilot flying, it's in control, and then for some reason in here, it might be, a, it might be an insider program who's managed to get that to drop when it shouldn't have been dropped. And then on the right side, a spurious request to take control, the button hasn't been pressed. Now from a safety point of view, it may be that you can consider each of these in isolation, and that's typically when you deal with, deal with faults, you do them one at a time. But in security, a concerted attack could exploit both of those vulnerabilities in sequence. So this is where the problem is slightly different. So from a safety point of view, you can probably deal with this uh, fairly, fairly comfortably. From a security point of view, looking at the system, it's hard to think of a protocol that you could design that would realize that you'd been attacked. So because you've got two things going wrong, and this would lead to mode confusion. Pilots don't know what's going on. And I think that's one of the major differences of safety and security is that if you really want to cause havoc from a security point of view, then create mode confusion. Uh, it's, it's one way of causing, causing, causing a problem on the aircraft or the car. So, what do we do about that? If we're dealing with the, ca of the case of safety-related security, then what's becoming quite common now in the last couple of years is to introduce the notion of a policing function. And that policing function is a high integrity formal model and it's developed and verified formally from the high level requirements and it's developed with independence. So the people who develop the code or the requirements or the design for this software component are not the same as who, de who define the policing function. And now you have this nice monitor policing function which is sitting on top of this and can look for these spurious responses and can it can decide whether this, uh, this, is, this has been attacked. And what you're doing is you're taking uh, mode confusion, which is a bad type of failure, and you can convert it into loss of function. This comes from some work that uh, John Rushby did at SRI in about 20, 2012. So not only can you mitigate the problem or eliminate the problem, but you can change the nature of the hazard. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with safety and security at system level, going down to the software level. What does this mean for the organization? So the nice thing about STPA is not only can you apply this to the design or the system level view, you can take it up into the organization. So typically you'll have some sort of project development and some verification function which gives you some notion of independence dealing with this. You'll have a safety function and a security function. These the typically different organizations, and one of the real problems is they tend to use different terminology in different languages. So the real challenge of verifying that the system that we, we're developing meets both its safety and its security requirements is that the verification function now needs to be quite very smart. So you need, and I think Adam talked about this earlier in the day, is what kind of what kind of people, engineers, do you need here who actually have the curiosity and the ability to deal with safety people, security people, and the, and the developers to come up with, uh, to ensure that the safety and security requirements have been met? Okay, to summarize. So, NIST 800-160 is very new, but it's worth reading. It's 250 pages, but 
if you do a search, you'll find a lawyer's guide to NIST 800-160. There's probably two or three of them up there. So the lawyers are already reading this, and they are working out how they're going to deal with this in court. And it's a very, very nice summary, as you'll find, of what that means. We already have 178C and 333, so that uh, drives a development and verification process. That gives you your, your, the way you can deal with the objectives and, and the way the process flows. STPA provides a system level method identifying the vulnerabilities, determining the safety and security constraints, and determining how unsafe control actions could occur. The policing function is developed formally from the requirements, can be used to monitor control processes, which are too complex to be verified formally. So you may have a control system which is using AI, uh, some machine learning. The police, policing function can sit above that, uh, those algorithms and ensure that the safety and security constraints are met. Uh, the policing function can deal with multiple vulnerabilities to mitigate against concerted attacks, ensures that the safety and security constraints are observed and can mitigate against this real problem of mode confusion. And having an independent verification function that has to deal with safety and security requirements and reliability requirements. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions for John? There's one around the corner. Oh, there's one around the corner, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hi there. Uh, yeah, Peter Thompson, Predictable Network Solutions. Um, uh, that was a very interesting talk, thank you. One, one thing that does slightly concern me is every time we introduce a new component, like a policing function, in principle you introduce new failure modes and potentially new attack vectors. So uh, how does one come to an end to this, to this, uh, this, this process? In, in the STPA process, it's two steps. First, you identify the problems. You come up with the architectural solution, which may be to introduce a policing function and then you reapply STPA. So every time you mitigate, you introduce some extra logic or extra components, you need to uh, apply the STPA again. So STPA uh, is used iteratively throughout, uh, from, from the system level requirements down through the derived requirements, low level requirements. Every time you do something like that, you need to reanalyze the safety and security constraints. Okay. Ashish? So John, thanks for the great talk. Um, what is the effort required in capturing all of these requirements and what is the manual uh, overhead, as it were, uh, to do this? I think a capturing requirements takes, as, as we know, takes a long time. Given that you have some cut of the requirements, and it can be very early in the process, so it might be at concept level, you have just a vague outline of the requirements. How long does it take to run STPA? You run it hierarchically, so you're running at the top level, um, with very few, few um, control actions. But you're focusing on control actions, and you're focusing on vulnerabilities, not threats. You're not trying to enumerate all the possible threats. You're just thinking about the vulnerabilities. In practice, I've been using STPA for four years, and th the time it takes, even on complex systems, can vary from a day to a week or maybe two weeks. It's not a long time. The, in the investment in doing the analysis in a structured way to reach these safety and security constraints is quite quick. One last one. Uh, do, do, do any of these standards require any uh, mandates for tool qualification? Or well, obviously, um, 178C has, has tool qualification issues. Um, as far as 800-160, it's working at a higher level than that. So I don't well, thank you very much. We set John a challenge to try and bring all, all four <laughs> items together, and I think he did a very good job of that. So thank you. Thank you, John.